Welcome to the Wealthy Circle Podcast, where we take a deeper dive into this year's finalists and winners from our WealthManagement.com Industry Awards. These interviews cover the challenges, innovations, and trends in the wealth management industry and the individuals working to help advisors better help their clients. Hello, my name is Brian Hamburger. I'm president and CEO of Market Council Consulting, and today I am joined by three real experts in the field to discuss compliance priorities in an evolving digital environment. Ryan George from DocuPace, Mac Bartine from Smart RIA, and Dan Bernstein uh, from Market Council. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Hey, Brian, how are you today? Great. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, the world that financial advisors are living in. As you all know really, really well, advisors are navigating an increasingly complex set of issues when it comes to regulatory compliance, thanks in large part to the digital revolution that has made compliance issues more numerous and more complicated than ever. These compliance parties have taken on a broader risk mandate to include the hot topics such as digital currency, ESG, cybersecurity, cloud computing, and even the potential theft of a client's digital assets or personal information. The SEC's new rule governing advertising and marketing is probably also going to have a major impact uh, on the oversight of record keeping and disclosure requirements in the coming year. And so I'm counting on you guys to discuss how leaders in compliance and in wealth management firms are really answering the bell when it comes to helping advisors manage risk in this rapidly changing environment. Mac, let me start with you. I think there's a, uh, a widespread belief out there that if you're doing business, with a, uh, with a third-party technology partner who's operating in the cloud, that it just simply presents a higher risk. Now, admittedly, uh, before you answer that question, there's also a belief out there, maybe a little bit lesser adopted, that, that there's nothing to worry about whatsoever. We all know the truth probably lies somewhere in between, but can you talk, you know, as someone who does host an application in the cloud, Tell me a bit about Smart RAA and exactly you know, what advisors should think about uh, when working with a cloud application. Right. So Smart RIA is a compliance management platform. We are cloud-based. Our servers are in Amazon Web Services. And what we try to do is to solve as many compliance problems and offer compliance workflows around as many compliance problems as possible in a single platform. And that means we're pulling a lot of different types of data into the platform. And that's where you know, the data risk comes in for customers in general in, in cloud computing, you're putting information into that so you can use it. And that's where your risk is. It's, uh, it's possible to do due diligence and to mitigate those factors. It's, it's certainly not true that everybody should feel kumbaya about putting their data into the wild. Uh, there, there are definite risks. Um, but it's also certainly not true that uh, you know, it's, it's something that you shouldn't do. It's, it's definitely something that you should do just with having done your due diligence on how that data is being protected by each vendor that you're using. Thanks for that, Mac. You know, Ryan, DocuPace, uh, you know, started out as just a kind of a, a records management, a document management platform, and, and has really captured headlines when it comes to it being a tool for effective record keeping for advisors. Can you talk to me a little bit about the, the application itself and how advisors have really changed their use of it? Brian, you're all correct. Uh, DocuPace celebrated our 20th anniversary uh, this year. So we are a grandpa, grandma fintech compared to a lot of the other people in the space. I mean, we did start off as document management, uh, but really record management is where, you know, one of the things we do today. And the reason that, you know, it's a critical tool we've seen advisors increase their usage of it is the connecting to other systems. So connecting to the CRM file so they can save client files connected to their CRM that they're using and be able to single sign on and directly into it and store all sorts of files, whether it's an audio file of a conversation or notes you had from a, um, a client meeting or um, you know everything from a PDF application as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Dan, welcome. I obviously know what you do really well. We work together every day, but 
inherent in both Ryan and Max daily work running these uh, these, these uh, applications is is the other side of the, the coin, right? How advisors need to assess their use of these applications. What should advisors be looking for when evaluating uh, financial technologies out there to ensure that the data that they're both transmitting and the data that they're entrusting to these applications remains safe? Yeah, so um, I think I think you have to be somewhat skeptical. So you know, when Mac mentioned that everything is at Amazon, I'm sure Mac is constantly monitoring what that means, what Amazon is doing, making sure that Amazon is doing the right thing. We've had other clients to say, "Hey, it's at Amazon. I'm good." Those were the same firms that said, "I invested with Bernie Madoff. We're good." <laughs> right. So so we don't make assumptions. Um, just because something is generally considered a trusted or big source, we still want to do some of that due diligence and really make sure that that third party is worth trusting. Because at some level, it does come down to trust. You're not there securing the servers. You didn't hire somebody to try to break in and, and steal stuff. So there's a trust level, but it's not blind trust. You need to do that due diligence. That's a great point, Dan. I think one of the things that people need in this business need to look at is not only the technology that they're doing business with, but who, what other technologies and systems is that technology connected with? I think that's something that is critical because when somebody's inside a system, um, you know, uh, whether it's malware, or whether it's somebody who wants to do harm or steal information, once they're in, they can find their way in through a third party system as well as they could through directly uh, hacking into their own system. Well, and, and to be clear, the SEC has pursued advisors before, not frequently, but they pursued advisors before in connection with, uh, with data breaches, uh, but it's not for the breach in and of itself, right? The standards are typically that the advisor has a level of due diligence that they need to, to conduct, that the contractual arrangements um, are sound, and that they are providing some degree of oversight. And in the event of the breach, that the advisor follows its obligation in both protecting, uh, you know, investigating, protecting, and then notifying, uh, notifying the clients. Mac, aside from utilizing uh, an enterprise class storage solution for uh, the application and its data, I know Smart RIA goes through some exhaustive, uh, an exhaustive audit process, and I suspect uh, you do as well, uh, Ryan. Uh, Mac, do you want to talk for a yes. moment about that? Absolutely. Uh, so the the gold standard of, or the most common gold standard of proving that you are doing what you're supposed to, to protect your client's data is a SOC 2 type 2 audit. And in that audit, they're looking at all of the policies and procedures of the tech platforms. They're looking at the techn technological structure uh, what's involved. They're looking at how that structure is accessed by the team that builds and maintains the technology, how customers access it, whether or not, you know, security protocols like two-factor authentication are involved and, and used in all of these things. And uh, so it's, it's really when, when you're doing due diligence, if you can get the SOC 2 type 2 and it looks good. There aren't a lot of you know, findings or issues that are reported. Then you can be relatively sure that this is a company that's doing the work to protect your data and your client's data, because you can't get a good audit on a SOC two type two unless you've done the work. Yeah. If anybody's are, ever are they one, regular? There's hundreds of lines, line items that, that the auditors go through. You know, painstakingly go through step by step. And I yes. do think, um, you know, the, they also cover preventative measures, which I think are important. Are you training employees on, you know, cybersecurity, ways to protect yourselves or phishing scams or what's out there? I think that's a critical part of it as well, because humans are still the biggest risk. Any advisory firm, any tech company, you know, it's, it's the humans that let the bad people in the door, um, unkno often unknowingly. So the more training and communication around it, the better. So, and so I think, I'll I think just throw this in and, and, and you can delete it if you want to, but <laughs> Smarter I just got its second SOC 2 type 2 audit back Friday of last week, zero deficiencies, zero findings. So perfect results. So let me, let me, do, let me uh, get an answer to my question. I assume the reason you guys are proud of uh, these audit results are that these audits are rigorous. They're, they're Very, genuine. 
So, Dan, is it enough that advisors can get the evidence of these audits and rely upon them to show that the applications they're using are indeed sound? Yeah, I think I think it's probably enough from what Mac and Ryan just explained. The key to any of this is, again, doing the work. So allowing somebody else to do the work is okay as long as that's a trusted source. So an independent source doing an analysis of their safety and security seems pretty uh, trustworthy to me. So as we know, you, you go ahead and get that audit, but the data has to make it up there, right? There's got to be transmission of data. Ryan, you just alluded to the biggest weakness in cybersecurity, which is always the people, right? We call it cybersecurity, but it's really not a technology issue. It's a people issue more often than not. Just because a firm is relying upon a top tier application that has the best data safety and handling practices out there, we still need to transmit the data there, right? So all it takes is, you know, a public Wi-Fi or uh, an unsecure connection. And that data is not getting there without being intercepted by, uh, you know, by someone who, you know, who would like to uh, like to get that. Have you guys seen that before? Have you had other instances that you've dealt with uh, in that manner? We haven't specifically, like like Mac, we uh, complete, you know, a SOC 2 each year as well. Um, and so we haven't seen that, you know, DocuBase, we have over 230,000 users on the platform and we are, you know, used for account opening and other client, client information. So we have lots of data that comes through our system or our systems that we're connected to. And so, you know, you, we are always vulnerable, just like any other system is vulnerable, but we are, um, you know, keep our eyes and ears and make sure that we are following the best practices as much as we can, as well as making sure our clients are following best practices as well. So the stewardship of that data, I think, is really important. I think for an advisor firm, large or small, I think one place to start is figure out what data they have, what data they have, what data they, uh, they have access to, what may need, what may be private, you know, PII information, what may just be general information, and then who inside the firm has it? Is it somebody who's a receptionist at the front desk? Do they actually have access to client files and client information? And do they need to have that access? That's something that, you know, an annual audit can help help elevate in terms of where you may, may need to be making changes. Uh, then when you go into advisors' offices, and you talk to them about uh, about cybersecurity. Where are the weak points? What what are advisors missing when it comes to cybersecurity? Yeah, I think to to what Ryan's point and what we've been talking about recently, it it is the people. I'd say that that is the clients as well as the advisors and their staff. So sometimes uh, all these issues emanate from a client's weakness. You know, a classic that we've been reading about for years, not just reading about getting phone calls about is um, someone having uh, a client having their Gmail account or Hotmail account hacked. Like that's, that's common. That's every, but it's making sure that the firm is prepared to not allow that issue to taint the rest of the firm. And it becomes a bit of a weakest link type of analysis. So when you come in and you just talk to the chief compliance officer and then you meet with management and everyone swears up and down how seriously they take cybersecurity, I believe every one of those people. They're not the ones that are generally letting someone in the door. It's maybe somebody that hasn't gotten the same training. Maybe it's a part-time staffer and they get a phone call, or excuse me, usually it's an email. They get an email and that email is from, um, from a hacked uh, 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 email account and, and they just want to do the right thing. They have a client asking for something and they want to help them out. And now that's just opened the door. Sometimes it just opens the door for that particular client's money to leave. Sometimes in the case of not having two-factor authentication and the like, it opens the door to, uh, to their whole system. So it really is a, a weakest link situation, and you can't just rely upon compliance and management to, uh, to be understanding of the needs. Makes onboarding of, of new personnel that much more important in, in how you do it. I think to Dan's point, I think everyone leads with the best of intentions and they assume that everything they're doing is what everyone else is doing, right? Uh, you know, we've had our share of, uh, of new staff and when we talk to them about how we protect all our critical systems with two-factor authentication, you know, a lot of them will respond with, well, that's such a pain. Well, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it, it's a little <laughs> bit of a pain, but it's certainly not a pain compared to uh, having to, to contend with a breach or... Uh, some type of spoof or other, uh, you know, or other incident, which uh, I think we're all, everyone on this call is hypersensitive uh, in, in having to deal with. Totally. Have you found that the climate has changed when it comes to cybersecurity? 
So as you guys implement new practices within your applications uh, that may require them to verify their identity, maybe it is two-factor authentication, maybe it is uh, a confirmation email. Have you found that people are a little more tolerant to those practices now than they were a few years ago? Yeah, I think they're actually driving the demand for them. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, if we're going through the vetting process or somebody's, you know, in our sales pipeline, that's a probably earlier in the, in the sale conversation than maybe it happened 10 years ago in terms of before this goes too far, let's talk about what compliance you know, procedures and other, you know, requirements you have in place. I think that especially at the enterprise level, you know, the bigger the firm, the bigger the risk um, they have to mitigate. And so I think that you'll see that, but that, that doesn't say that small firms don't have a similar um, uh, responses as well. Yeah. I think, so uh, I want to bring up kind of a, um, a, a separate but a related topic, which is, which is one of integration, right? So we talk about, you know, the applications and the security measures you can take to conduct due diligence and, and to, to monitor uh, the safety and performance of the applications that the advisor is using. We talked a bit about cybersecurity and, you know, and how folks uh, both use and transmit data to, to the applications. But looking at integration, I think, is a, is a whole new web, right? Because typically we're bringing, we're taking two applications, we're often bringing a third application or some other way to transmit that data. Uh, Is that the new frontier of where the risks may lie, right? That each application keeps its own side of the street clean, but but the integration between the two is, uh, is one that maybe people aren't checking as closely, or am I being naive here? Any, any tech platform worth it salts both has integrations and is incredibly careful about the security of those integrations and the security of the companies that they're integrating with you know we have due diligence that we have to do also so it's it's you know it's certainly one of the places where something can go wrong i don't know that i would say it's a problem beyond the broader problem, which is cybersecurity threats are everywhere and they're increasing in complexity. They're increasing in sophistication in terms of the the bad actors who want to get that data. And uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a problem that you really have to stay on top of. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Let's talk about one of the more recent developments that I think is going to drive some additional record keeping, which is the, you know, the SEC's marketing rule. Dan, you want to kick things off and just describe, you know, what this new rule uh, entails and, and principally what changes for advisors? Sure. So there, there's some changes, but I think the best changes are that the new marketing rule on the whole fits in better with the Investment Advisors Act. And what I mean by that is it is on the whole more principles based rather than being as rules-based. There are rules in there, right? There's rules, especially when it comes to things that the SEC finds a bit more risky, um, you know, with regard to the use of testimonials, with regard to the use of performance advertising, probably being the biggest one. But on the whole, we've been freed up a little from some of the um, kind of rigid, you can't do this, you can't do that. And then a ton of just, just different no action letters over 30, 40, 50 years, whatever it was. So the biggest changes, the uh, the fact that we do have a little bit more freedom in determining maybe what's misleading in some cases and the like, but we're still going to have that same general overall, can't be fraudulent, can't be misleading, can't be promissory. The same stuff that probably used to drive some marketing people crazy is now is now right in there in the rule. Um, but the, the solicitation aspect, so being able to pay solicitors, endorsers, testimonials, that's probably, if anything, become a, a, a bit looser. Except we did have another enforcement action recently with Kim Kardashian, which kind of showed just how important the SEC is going to find those disclosures that have to be made when you're paying somebody for referrals and solicitations. So so that's kind of softened a bit. But, you know, on the whole, I think um, we, we have that as an advantage. We're now allowed to use testimonials and endorsements as investment advisors. That's new. That was always specifically forbidden. Like there was no, there was really not much of a line there other than you can't use it. Um, And then the biggest change that advisors will need to deal with is adding some, not even so much additional disclosures, but how they're going to present their, um, their performance advertising. Yeah. You know, and Brian, as a, as a marketer, um, a marketer by heart and a marketer by trade, you know, I think there's both the excitement and a word of caution. I think I would coach advisors to to not, you know, their marketing practice that exists today 
Um, they should choose wisely as far as what they want to adopt and bring into their systems. Testimonials have been, as Dan said, that forbidden fruit. But, you know, if you're going to invite the risk of testimonials into your business, you should figure out exactly why and how and make it be critical um, to your overall marketing plan, not just have that out there. I think um, we've all, you know, I think of a doctor um, and, you know, I used to go to a doctor who worked for a corporation and he said, you know, if I don't prescribe people the medicine they ask for, I can get a bad rating. And then my bosses from the corporation say, you know, well, why did you, why did that patient give you a bad rating? It's because, so there is, I mean, there's some natural harm that could be there if advisor um, is sort of opening that door to sort of star ratings or, you know, Google ratings and, and sort of using them from a promotion standpoint. In addition to that, I think we can talk about conflicts. So we can all admit that conflicts exist, right? So the SEC, FINRA thinks conflicts exist. It, um, whether regardless of the type of advisor you are, you know, addressing those conflicts earlier and often I think it's going to be a drive a better trusted relationship with that client. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Have you, have you added features uh, within DocuPace that allow advisors to, to utilize the platform to maintain records and to help, you know, to help with this new marketing role? Yeah. So one of our, um, not specific to the marketing role, but to Rick BI. So they actually a uh, finalist for uh, the wealthiest this year in compliance was our uh, compliance tracker, which is a, a digital delivery of the form CRS, um, DOL, PTE, you know, 2020 indicator rules as far as disclosures. And what that is, is a way that an advisor can digitally deliver the important disclosures and have a client attest to them um, that they have read and reviewed them. It's one of the cool things about the platform. It was also, it will continue to try to send them to the electronically to the client if they don't respond in an auto physical mail a mailing is sent so we can ensure um, from an auditable standpoint that the disclosures have been fully disclosed. And I think that's that's a feature that we have um, we saw an increase in popularity from. Fact, has, has this new marketing rule kicked up uh, any new issues for SmartRA? You know, it hasn't kicked new issues up, but we certainly have plans for rolling out a new module specifically for the new mod marketing rule that uh, is going to streamline documentation when people are advertising, using testimonials or solicitations, et cetera. Uh, just making sure that everything is in place and, and showing that it's in place. So, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's interesting. You know, Ryan, you, you had mentioned uh, something to the effect of, well, advisors really want to think twice, right, before engaging in some of this type of marketing. And I think we've we may have finally reached a point where advisors are showing some degree of discipline, right? It's not all about features. It's not all about what can they do. It's more about, should I be doing this, right? Is there a business case to, to use this? And I find that very similar to their use of applications, right? Before, they were just looking for as many capabilities as they could possibly get. Now the tide is turning. It's, well, will my users really be engaged? You know, will this allow us to to be safer? Will this allow us to be more comprehensive to, you know, to drive uh, efficiencies. I mean, whatever their use case is, they're they're looking at it and they're evaluating it with a little less awe uh, than they used to, and a little and, and a little less wonder maybe, but uh, a little more purposeful. I think. Yeah, I mean, think we. There's been a tremendous proliferation of ways that advisor can communicate either with the clients, the public, whomever. All that includes risk. All that includes time. You know, to create those materials, to to send those communications. And I think there's nothing more valuable for an advisor to optimize than how they spend their time. So, you know, deciding where where they can deliver the most value to their business and to their clients, I think, is critically important. Yeah, yeah. Brian, just to, to jump in, I think I think the two topics that we just discussed primarily uh, it really show the pivot and the bridge of technology. The, the first part being the use of technology being a possible compliance issue, right? Making sure that data is protected and you've done all your due diligence because that's a risk and a weakness. The second part, you know, the, um, the, the, um, the marketing rule is not really a technology-based rule. You can use technology for your marketing. You can use old paper. You can be on TV, you can be on radio. What we just discussed here, what Max putting together, what Ryan has, you know, that's the use of technology to help streamline and document your compliance. So it, I guess it's kind of a little it giveth and it taketh, but you know, I do think the SEC is starting to get used to advisors using technology and kind of expecting to see them use technology to a certain extent, to use what tools are out there to run a more efficient compliance program and therefore a more efficient um, examination as well. 
Yeah, Jan, I think, I mean, I think technology is exactly right, Mac. Mac, I think you would agree that, um, you know, technology is actually a way to, for make it easier to comply with changing regulations that were, they're going to keep Absolutely. changing. This conversation could, we could have this every year with a whole new slew of changes that are either proposed or becoming in effect. Yeah. So I, I don't know if the technology is making it easier to comply, to be fair. I think that technology is making it easier to demonstrate your compliance, right? But once you, you know, once you've already done that, uh, it, you know, certainly hasn't made it easier for us to take vacation and stuff, but it has allowed us to, to remain in contact with the office when we are on vacations. You know, we, we were charged today with sitting down and talking about compliance priorities and evolving digital world. Can we all agree that the world has now evolved to such a point where technology is no longer a silo, right? Technology has just become something that advisors have to weave into every single aspect of their business. Yes. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Yeah. And so, in, you know, we talk about compliance in the very same way, right? I mean, at, at big enterprise firms, I know there's a compliance department uh, at most independent wealth management firms. There may be someone who there should be someone who leads the compliance initiatives, but, you know, compliance really provides a, an operational baseline standard, you know, under which the firm just, you know, shall not pass. Right. So compliance is, is a standard that gets woven into every aspect of their business, regardless of its advertising and marketing or if it's trading. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we just need to be cognizant that we're, we've reached a tipping point where these things are omnipresent. Great. Yes. Gentlemen, Ryan, Mac, Dan, uh, I want to thank you guys for, uh, for joining me for, for this segment. Congratulations on your, on your Wealth Management uh, Industry Award. Uh, it is an honor. I know it was a really, uh, really crowded field. I'm really excited that uh, that we've been able to show up for eight awards in the eight years of uh, of, of the program and uh, look forward to hearing more from you guys real soon. This content has been made for information and educational purposes only. The views and opinions represent the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views and opinions of wealthmanagement.com.